This is the Guns Magazine podcast, episode number 47. Hi there, and welcome to the Guns Magazine podcast. I'm your host and the editor of Guns Magazine, Brent Wheat. Thanks for joining us as we talk to the interesting people who make up the world of shooting, hunting, and the firearms industry. Before we get started, let's talk about our sponsor, Kimber Firearms. Kimber was founded with the singular purpose of making every firearm the best it can possibly be with a fit and finish that only practiced hands can achieve and appreciate. Whether you carry a Kimber for personal protection, hunting, or competition, know that their promise of quality without compromise is how they measure success. To learn more about Kimber Firearms, visit KimberAmerica.com. Today, you get to eavesdrop. I'm talking with my former, now retired, boss, Roy Huntington, about hunting in Africa. I'm making tentative plans to visit the continent in two years, so I wanted to talk with Roy about the ins and outs of going on safari. Roy and his wife Susie are old Africa hands and just returned late last year from a planes game hunt in newly opened Botswana. He's a wealth of information on the tricks of the safari trade, so I plan on picking his brain for all it's worth. Now here's Roy Huntington as we talk about safari. Well, good afternoon, Roy. Good afternoon, sir. Well, I thought it'd be kind of cool if today we talked about Africa because I finally been bitten by the bug and I'm making plans to go in two years. My wife's on board with it. Uh, I've got a buddy and his wife that, that want to go. So we need to sit down and talk about how do I do this? Because I now I've made the big decision, but I don't know where to go from there. So I guess we'll chat about all that stuff today. You no, know, and it's it's... A little harder than you think, and it's also a lot easier than you think. I'll take the second part, and we'll we'll deal with the first part. So, okay, we we've made the big decision. So, where do you go from there? Well, you know, lest you you get overwhelmed because everyone you either have this imaginary uh, idea, and you're you're Theodore Roosevelt, and you're on a three month safari with you know, with bearers, you know, and then yeah, hundreds of lineup, porters and all hundreds that. of porters and then double rifles and all that kind of stuff. Well, I mean, that technically still exists, but none of we mere mortals will ever <laughs> experience yeah, that's that. That's not going to be my experience. Mm-mm. I, I would recommend since the, since you're going to go to Africa, be thinking of it as this will be my first trip to Africa. Uh-huh. And, and then don't try to do too much at once. And because I think you want to go there to relax and to have the fun. And so I would say the first thing you need to decide is what do you sort of want to experience? And if you don't know what you want to experience, then you need to talk to people who've been there and look at pictures and read articles in our magazines and, you know, and see YouTube videos and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, but if you, if you keep in the back of your brain, it's, it's a multiple step uh, process. And so first off you say, I want to go to Africa. Well, now you have to decide what do you want to do in Africa? And let's say, and this is what I recommend is that you, you do a very simple planes game hunt and planes game are kudu and zebra and wildebeests and impalas and, you know, things like that, uh, the box, all the box, you know, bless box and hems box. And Susie calls them the Bach family. (laughs) And so these are all planes game and none of them are really dangerous game. And uh, so if you can decide, okay, I would like to take about maybe five game animals. I wouldn't look for less than that. And then you can actually start shopping to uh, locations that you can go to. And historically, there's a lot of, of course, places to hunt in Africa, but I, there's a couple of places I would stay away from. Ah, important info. Yeah. And I, my first trip, I went to Zimbabwe. And once we got to the game, you know, to the ranch uh, by light plane, it was okay. But it was terrifying otherwise, because when you look up third world country, you know, there's like a picture of Zimbabwe there. And yeah. And and when you get to go to the federal government travel and advisory website, it's almost always leads with don't go to Zimbabwe, you know, unless you're an idiot. <laughs> you <know? laughs> and I mean, the where we were, it was great. 
you know, we were a hundred miles from anywhere, but boy, other than that, it's just really scary there. And I just, I mean, unless you're really accomplished and you've been to Africa before and you really have a relationship with your professional hunter and the service and stuff, I would seriously don't go there. Um, ah. Now there's an, something else you want to be careful about is that just like any popular thing, uh, there are, organizations in Africa, there are hunters, professional hunters and, and uh, ranches in Africa who cater to, I like to call him kind of the weekend safari guy. Yeah. So it's a guy who, you know, he's a plumber. He's saved up his $8,000. He's going to go to Africa. He's got three or five days he's going to hunt in Africa. You know, maybe he's got a week vacation and he wants to cram all this in there. Well, there's a lot of that in South Africa. <clears throat> Not everything in South Africa is bad, but you just have to be aware that just because there's a picture of a kudu on their website and there's a safari truck and there's a scenic sunset in the background and all that, you might be on a $3,000 fenced game ranch. Wow. And they'll actually bring game in and release them in the ranch because they know you want a kudu. <laughs> yeah. And so those are the kind of things you have to really be informed of before you kind of pull the trigger literally and figuratively. So, so let's say you've made that decision to go to Africa. Don't try to bite off too much. Uh, decide where you want to go. I'm a strong proponent of Namibia, uh, a very nice country. They're nice people. It's safe to go there. I was going to uh, say you don't hear much about Namibia. No, it's hard to say, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so most people say Namibia, you know, <laughs> so I'm going there, you know, but it's Namibia. And uh, Susie and I went there and it was just delightful. And the people were great and the animals were nice and, and it's safe and the, you recognize the food and they have good beer and wine and all that kind of stuff. And so our last trip, we went to Botswana and now Botswana had been closed to hunting for almost 10 years. And so yeah. we were literally among some of the very first people who were in and able to do that. And it was spectacular. We were hunting in the Kalahari Desert. I'll get into some details of that uh, a little bit later on, but... But I think to prepare yourself, there's a couple of things I, I would really like everyone to know. And that is that uh, I would really recommend that you don't take a gun with you, at least for your first trip, ah. because it's it's overwhelming. Uh, you know, you, you have to make sure all the paperwork and permits are done. Uh, you have to schlep this hunting rifle around in a hard lockable case. Uh, you're going to be going through multiple customs stations in some situations, you have to take possession of your luggage and then go through customs and then recheck your luggage. And so, which means then that you're checking rifles again and again and again. And then when you arrive at the country, there's sort of like this temporary import procedure you have to go through. And depending on the country, it's probably going to cost you a little bit of money under the counter too. <laughs> uh, just... Yeah, to get things expedited, as it were. Yeah. Uh, and so the first couple times I flew with guns, and then and it just took up a huge amount of time, not, not counting the fact that you're anxious the entire time. You know, are my guns going to make it? You know, and <clears throat> usually they're, you're limited on the ammunition you can take. It depends on the country. And so you're worried about your ammunition. You're worried about the guns. You're am I going to get in trouble? Are they going to steal my guns? You know, what am I going to do? So the vast majority of hunting, you know, reserves and, you know, pHs and stuff can supply you with a suitable rifle. And so it's just like, if you think any bolt action deer rifle, that's a planes game rifle. So mm -hmm. a, a 270, a 308, a 300 wind mag, all that kind of stuff works just fine. You don't need some big monster gun and they have them all because they need them because they call you know, game, they back up their hunters and all that kind of stuff. And usually for a very modest fee, and I'm talking like, you know, $25 or something like that a day, a few dollars for the cartridges, because ammo is very expensive down there. So, and then for that, you don't have to worry about anything. So yeah. you just show up in camp with your luggage, <laughs> you know, your carry on bag. And then the, you zero the rifle the next day, you get a shot or two with it, and then you go hunting. So, and it's, trust me, it's just really nice. You know? And then uh, when you go the next time, if you want to bring your own rifle, then do that. So uh, 
not good. And I got it because it's your favorite Model 70. It's grandpa's rifle. You want to take it to Africa. You know, it's the 458 that you bought when you were 16 years old because you wanted to go to Africa. That's great. There's nothing wrong with that. Do it later. (laughs) <laughs> you know, <laughs> well, you hit on something that uh, circle back on uh, deciding on uh, what to go hunt. My, I don't necessarily want to take all of the big five, but I, I am intrigued by Cape Buffalo. But everybody, including yourself, have told me, okay, slow down, speed racer, get your feet wet, go hunt plains game, and then you can go after the things that'll smush you up into a little puddle of Toll House cookie mix. <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, if, if, if you're a rabid, you know, white-tailed deer hunter and you go every year and you go antelope hunting and, you know, if you're a hunter and you kind of have that gene and you've got the experience and you know how to run a rifle and, you know, you don't get buck fever and stuff, well then, okay, maybe you could bite off a little bigger chunk there, you know, on your first trip. But if you're Sam and Susie homemaker and, you know, you like went deer hunting a couple times or something, well then I agree with you completely, you know, maybe segueing off and doing a, a, a buffalo hunt while you're doing a kudu hunt, you know, may or may not be a good idea. Now, a lot of that you could do once you get there. In other words, if you, you'll have a plains game hunt and a lot of places will say, if you'd like to also shoot a buffalo, for instance, well, that's an additional $3,000 and ah. we can take two days and do that over here. So if you find out from your professional hunter or for, from the organization that that's something they offer, well, once you get there, you know, then you could kind of make a decision like, Hey boy, I really got the urge. I really want to do that. Yeah. You know, uh, let's say though, you have made a decision, you're going to go to South Africa or Namibia, or you're going to go to, to Botswana. Uh, I don't recommend you hunt for any less than seven days and 10 days is better. And Ah. I know that sounds crazy. You think 10 days, You know, and you're going to need two days to get there and you're going to need two days to get back. So, yes, you are looking at two weeks. And but if this really is a lifetime thing for you, well, then I don't know, suck it up and do what you need to do to get the two weeks. You know, Uh, because I I have seen too many people. I've talked to readers and they get enthused. They go to South Africa. They go to some 2000 acre game ranch. They're there for three days. You know, it was like, bang, 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 you're done. Two dinners around the campfire, you haul ass back, you fly back for two days. And it's like, what just happened? I don't even know what I just did. Yeah. You know, uh, and, and what I found on where we've gone the last time, Susie and I, I think we were in country almost 12 days, but cause you go there and of course you're wound up. So the first day, you know, you get in, you get into the camp and you have a good time and every, you have a sundowner and you drink and have a good time and then you go hunting the next day well then usually you crash because you you know you've got that jet lag and you're and you're amped up and you're tired and and so usually by day two or three it's really nice to just take a day off and then you just you know you enjoy the the facilities and you maybe go on a little tour somewhere you know there's always something to do like that uh get to know the people and uh a lot of places will let you actually help with the game management, you know, so you could help do maintenance at the water holes or you know, oh, fix wow. a fence and yeah, do stuff. And it's fun because it gives you stories to tell and, and like, pictures to take and all that kind of stuff. And then, then the next day you go back to hunting and it's just really nice. It's civilized. Well, that sounds cool. And I, and I love all those ideas. So let's get right into it. What is a typical average day of hunting, especially for planes game? What's that like? What time you get up? What time you get back? All that. Okay, so let's say you arrived and now you're there. Uh, something to remember is that people generally overpack. They do your laundry every single day. Ah. And I know it sounds weird and, you, and it almost doesn't seem like that could possibly be true, but it is. And so whenever I've gone, you basically go with three sets of clothes, three shirts, three pants, you know, three or four underwear, three or four socks, you know, toss in a pair of tennis shoes, toss in a pair of shorts, you know, maybe a tank top. That's it you know, a light jacket if you're going that time of the year. Because as when you wear your clothes out the first day and you come back that night, well, then you wear your second set the next day. And when you get back, the previous day's clothes are washed and ironed and sitting on your bed. (laughs) How wonderful. It's wonderful. Yeah. And uh, so you, so most Americans tend to overpack and the pHs I've talked to says, yes, that's, they always bring way too much stuff. Right. (laughs) So 
you don't need a skinning knife. You don't need, you know, a huge backpack and all that kind of stuff. It's basically concentrate on personal things. Have a little personal folding knife, a pocket tool is kind of handy, you know, whatever little camera you have. And uh, I would recommend use your phone for a lot of that stuff. But I would also have a little pocket digital camera as a backup, you know, uh, and just always don't carry a big you know, DSLR or something that's just in the way, but just a little shirt pocket, you know, double A battery, Canon camera kind of a thing. And then that way you've got that as a good backup. So, yeah. so, so now you're there, you get up in the morning, usually there's some kind of a light breakfast, uh, depending on what you're hunting and the style where you're hunting. You know, a lot of times you really don't get into the truck until seven, eight, nine o'clock in the morning. Oh, wow. Uh, because most of these animals are out all day. Uh, unless you're like doing a leopard hunt at night or something like that, there's really nothing that you hunt at nighttime like that. So there, it's really great. So there's no getting up at four o'clock in the morning. <laughs> now, the only time you have to do that though, is if you have to drive like two hours or something to where you're hunting. So, uh, but that's okay. It's all part of the adventure. Uh, so you get up in the morning, you have a interesting breakfast and, uh, everybody loads into the trucks. Most of the trucks they use are land cruisers. Uh, they're these big kind of open back land cruisers or another kind of a Toyota truck that looks like kind of a, about a medium size pickup truck, you know, like a courier, uh -huh. you know, old Ford medium size, to only a little bit biggie size. And uh, they're made sort of specifically as uh, diesel powered work trucks there. And so you can't get them here, unfortunately. I, I think if you're listening, uh, Google like African Toyota work truck or something, you'll see <laughs> pictures of this kind of stuff. Uh, they're really cool. Uh, they're kind of small, but in that truck, then you'll have the, the pH, your professional hunter. You'll probably have a driver uh, who will be one of the native guys. Uh, there'll, there'll be one, sometimes two trackers that go with you. And then you, you. And usually you and the PH will ride in the back of the truck and they all have these built-in seats. So you sit up high, you know, you kind of look over the, the roof of the cab. And uh, rifles are carried usually cased uh, with, a, with a loaded magazine or, or loaded, you know, but with an empty chamber. Uh, you, most of everybody actually that I've been around has been really safety conscious. And, uh, and then you go out. And so like if today you're going to be hunting for Impala, well, the trackers have some idea of where the best impalas are. And so then you drive around till you find them. And then you can decide usually, do you want to do a stock, you know, like to have the excitement of it? And so yeah. if that's the case, they park the truck, everybody gets out. Uh, PH goes first, you go second, trackers go behind you. And this is where Americans mess up <laughs> all the time. <laughs> because uh, the PHs are telling you two things. Either... American hunters are really organized, like they're squared away, their gear is organized, their rifles are sighted in, you know, they're good shots, they pay attention, or else they're complete squirrels. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I have seen both. <laughs> and yeah. the thing to remember when you're there is that you're there to hunt. And if you're behind the pH and you're actively hunting for something, well, then you need to be focusing on the pH is don't be looking at the birds and don't be picking your nose <laughs> and don't be, you know, <laughs> taking your hat off and fixing your thing. you right. You have to be focused on the pH and, uh, and you'll be carrying your rifle safely. And then you do what he, he or she tells you to do. And which brings up a good point before you go practice shooting from shooting sticks. And we can talk a little bit about that because you'll shoot from shooting sticks Yeah, and cause they don't want you to miss. So there's no adventure there. They want you to do well, but what Americans use, this is another place that they always mess up is that when he puts the shooting sticks up and he says, get the third one from the right. Well, you need to have your rifle on the shooting sticks and the bolt run and the sight on target and the game shot, <laughs> you know, yeah. you don't be messing around because one thing I learned about African game is that remember they're basically food for everything. Right. And so when you see African game animals, they're either running or they're running. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I mean, it's just, and then they stop every once in a while and take a breath and then they run, you know? So, yeah. so when he says, shoot that, 
well then you don't don't mess around and like this one guy told me he said you yanks <laughs> you know, he said they'll you'll like fix your glasses and then you'll you know you'll adjust your pack and then you'll put your <laughs> rifle on the sticks and then you'll focus the scope and then you'll forget to take the safety off and then you'll adjust your shoulders again and then she's, and meanwhile like we're going like shoot 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 <laughs> and then whatever game animal that they've been tracking all morning for you now runs off. Yeah. I was just working on a story, Dave Anderson, our rifles columnist in guns magazine. That's the topic of his column for this month, which uh, will be in a, actually out in a couple of months. And it was talking about all the screw ups that guides see. And that was number one, you know, shoot him. Well, then you got to adjust your hat and your glasses and <laughs> clean the scope and, you know, <laughs> It's really true. And it makes it makes the guides just crazy. Makes them crazy. I had one guy, he literally took his hat off and threw it on the ground. <laughs> he, he was so mad. And because well, uh. I hunted with this one guy. And so he used to bring a backpack. And if you're hunting from the truck, you're, you're and you're out, just out, I'm going to do a little stock right here. I'm going to shoot this Impala or something. Yeah. I would always put an energy bar in my pocket and a bottle of water in my pocket just because you never know. Cause sometimes that stuff turns into 10 hours. Yeah. Right. And as we were gone 10 hours one time and nobody had any water and it was like really ugly. And I said, I'm never going to do that again, but there's really no need for a backpack. And ah. There's barely need for you to have binoculars. And so what I always did was I always have a lightweight pair of binoculars. You put over your neck and then push it around your back, you know, behind mm -hmm. you. So it's out of the way. And then if there's a pause in action, you want to look at the, you know, wooly wooker birds or something, fine, you know, get it out. If you're glassing zebra and they're a quarter of a mile away, there's nothing wrong with that. Have a good time. But while you're hunting behind the pH, you, those binoculars need to be put away and you, all of your attention should be on him and what he's, you know, what he's hunting with you. And, uh, and I had this one guy we were hunting with and it was invariably I remember we were chasing this champion kudu. I would have given my eye teeth to be the guy up to shoot this one. Eyes along. And so the, I'm watching. I'm saying, okay, there, oh boy, man, that's a nice one. There it is. I see the PH. He puts the sticks down. He points. He turns around and looks. And the hunter is back to the PH with his binoculars looking at like a kookaburra or something. Oh, I don't know. My. Right? You know. Wow. And so I reached up and I poked him. And I went, you know, and he, so he you know, puts the binoculars down and kind of turns around and then does that classic adjust his hat and, you know. <laughs> oh, I remember what he did. He, he, he shrugged off his backpack, oh. and which, of course, spooked the game animal. Yeah. And that's when the PH took his hat off and threw it on the <laughs> tree. <you know>? And, <laughs> wow. So don't be that guy, whatever you need. Yeah. So, so, okay, so let's say that's what you do. And then you, you shoot. Hopefully the, the animal goes down and African animals do tend to be tougher than white-tailed deer. Mm -hmm. I mean, you think you could shoot a 250 pound white-tailed deer with a 243 and pretty much, you know, if you hit it right, it's going to go down. Yeah. Well, there, remember lion food, you know, <laughs> I mean, we, we were on, Susie had to shoot a zebra seven times and wow. every shot it was dead. It just didn't know it yet, you know? Wow. So it's not that you need big cartridges, but you just, you know, you need to shoot well. And then they're often, now sometimes they go right down, you know, if you spine them or something like that, but don't be surprised when you shoot one of these animals and it runs off. That just means you got the first shot, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but the, the, almost the fun of that part though, is, uh, is you get to see the trackers in action and ah. everything you've ever seen on TV about trackers is true. Only in the real world, it's even more. It's, huh. it's truly astounding. But well, the other thing I was going to say, too, is when, when he, he puts those tripods down, or the, they're usually just two twin shooting sticks, and you put the first shot on the game animal, what they want you to do then, if it doesn't go right down, is just keep shooting at it. Right. And you don't have to worry about perfect heart lung. They want you to put bullets in the target mm -hmm. uh, because this may be the only chance you're going to have to connect for the next five miles. And yeah. so... So you're going to shoot, run the bolt, shoot again, run the bolt, shoot again, run the bolt, shoot again, you know, and nobody's going to make fun. Everyone's going to applaud and pat you on the back and say, good shooting. You know? <laughs> uh, and then hopefully you put enough bullets in this tenacious animal that they'll eventually go down. Yeah. So you've got game, you, you shot good and fine and honorably, and you've got game down now. What happens? Actually, it even gets more interesting because 
the, I mean, you shoot a kudu that weighs 600 pounds. Well, I, there's, I'm not seeing a winch anywhere. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and they are so clever that I have seen a professional hunter and two trackers and me get a six or 700 pound zebra or kudu or something like that into the back of one of these little Toyota trucks. And they just have done it so many times. They just really understand how you leverage it up and do that. Uh, usually they'll gut them there. So that gets rid of quite a bit of weight. Yeah. Uh, but one clever thing that they did in when I was in Botswana, because it's sand, it's the Kalahari desert. Uh huh. Well, what they would do is that they, they would dig two holes for the rear wheels and then they, it would, they would back the truck into it. So basically the tailgate was lowered right down to the dirt. Wow. And so, yeah. So then everybody just kind of like kind of starts to pull it back up and then you can kind of back the truck up and presto your kudu or Elon. We loaded like about an 1100 pound Elon that way. No and kidding. It just, you know, four or five people did it. I was, I was so surprised. They don't skin and quarter it right there. They take it back to camp. No, because, well, first of all, you could have a two hour drive back to camp. And yeah. uh, so now you, let's say you're done for the day. If you, you may take another animal, you know, so, I mean, we've come back at the end of the day with three or four animals in the truck, oh, wow. which I, they overload these things shamelessly. And it's just <laughs> hysterical, but it's all part of the fun. Uh, when you get back to camp, there's always a skinning shed. <clears throat> and uh, when you show up, it's like all these guys appear out of nowhere sharpening old rusty butcher knives <laughs> and uh, everybody high fives. And, you know, you did all your picture taking back where you took the animal. Right. And uh, they drag it out on the ground. And uh, if you, I recommend you stay at least a couple of times, because uh, remember these are really nice people and yeah. it's really fun to talk to them. And even if you can't speak their language, you laugh and joke and, you know, you pat each other on the back and they, and they'll show you things, you know, they'll, as they skin it, they point things out. They'll, yeah. they'll find your bullet sometimes. Very uh, cool. And, uh, and usually within about 30 minutes, man, I'll tell you what, it is skinned, caped, quartered. <laughs> I mean, it's like, choo, done. And in most camps, uh, you actually eat what you shoot. Yeah. And so, you know, for dinner that night or the next night will be Elon backstrap or, you know, kudu or, and you know what? It's all excellent. I didn't have anything bad. Really? I mean, all of it is memorable and not gamey or anything. You know, I was really surprised. So while they skin, then you go over and you get cleaned up and then you have a, a sundowner and then you have dinner and then you talk about what a great shot you made and how <laughs> wonderful it was. And, <laughs> yeah. and gee, did you see the elephant, you know? <laughs> okay. Talking about elephants and lions, I know you, you know, there's certainly lions in the Kalahari where you were. Uh, do you see that kind of stuff or do you have to be looking for it? Or, I mean, are you going to run into it if you walk out into the, the brush or how's that work? Well, that's a good question. And it's a good thing because everyone has this imaginary, imaginary thing. It's like, what was that movie uh, out of Africa with uh -huh. Meryl Streep and the world's most handsome man in the world. I can't remember his name, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and, and at some level it is like that. Of course that was 120 years ago, you know, but you know, where we were, we saw, we didn't see any lions. We weren't looking for the lions, but we did see lion tracks. And huh. it's really disquieting to walk down a trail. And then when you walk back later, there's lion tracks on top of your tracks. Wow. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. When, when I was in Zimbabwe, they said that we had to stay together because it was jungle there. Yeah. So we had to stay together. And they said, if you went off the, the track to, you know, take a leak or something that you had to take a tracker with you and you all had to always have your rifle. Uh -huh. And, uh, and there, there were also elephants and so, and we were toe to toe with a few elephants. I really, you know, one time, yeah. One time the, the P I would, I just had a 308, a little short 308 and the PH had a 500 Krieghoff, uh, <laughs> 500 nitro express double rifle. And cause that was his stopping rifle because there were elephants and lions and yeah. you know, that kind of stuff. And, uh, so we had this big elephant came out, you know, I mean, he was like, I don't know, 50 feet away and he was young and they were doing this like baloney charge at you, you know, yeah. let you and flap their ears and all this kind of stuff. And, uh, he said, he said, shoot his ear if I tell you to do that. Oh, 
And I thought, I don't, well, okay, well, do you remember what's your job? Do whatever the do what he says. says. And so he's yelling at it and, you know, and stuff and waving his arms and stuff. And so, so it turns and, and trundles off. And, uh, and I said, why would you shoot at Sears? And he said, well, if they charge it, if, you know, with, in your case, since you have the rifle behind me there, so you shoot his ear, it'll, it'll like a, a bug bite, you know, and it'll, it'll turn them and then they'll, they'll forget what they were doing, you know, and they'll turn them <laughs> off in another direction. And sure enough, I saw some of these that did have what I, certainly looked like bullet holes in their ears. No but kidding. He said it is something that has happened before, but I, he had a video of him stopping a charge with a, one of his clients and it was, it was one of those that literally fell at their feet. Oh you my. Know? And I have to say, we didn't have anything dramatic like that happen. That was the most exciting thing, but it is very, very un domestic sportsman like to look up and peering at you from the jungle, 15 feet away, you see an eye and you realize that that's connected to a three ton elephant. Wow. Who could just stomp you into the dirt, yeah. you know? And it's like, there's, boy, there's no fences out here, you know? Yeah. We're not in Kansas anymore. No, you're really not. <laughs> and that's why I think it's, that you're, this is you're only going to be your first trip, because I promise you, while you're there, you're already making plans to <laughs> come again, you know? I also learned something interesting is that we did hear some lions and that lions don't go roar. They don't roar, you know, they don't do that. Yeah. Lions, I don't know if I can do it. Let me try it. Lions go like this. They go, they do that really <laughs> and it's like and you get the little creepy creepies up yeah because you realize that you're actually food <laughs> you're actually, <laughs> we're not the top of the food chain there no you're not and i'll tell you something else really interesting the ph told me was he said if we get a t charged by a lion drop down to one knee and shoot directly at the lion and i thought well, I asked him, I said, well, don't you want to like run, you know, behind the tree? <laughs> and he said, no, you can't get away. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, so basically, he's, you know, you, you can't run because you'll yeah. just die tired, right? Exactly. But I said, well, wh why do you drop to one knee? And he said, well, if you try to shoot at a line that's running at you while you're standing, it's the angles constantly changing, mm -hmm. you know, as it comes at you. And he said, if you drop down, then you're shooting straight at it. Right. And, and you'll be more inclined to think not, but I personally, I thought, well, you've got to have pretty big huevos to kneel down <laughs> in the face of a charging lion. Wow. <laughs> and I'm glad we didn't have to do that. So, well, like they say, you don't have to outrun the lion. You just have to outrun your guide. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> but let's not try that. <laughs> no, uh, but that's basically it. And then, so you do that however many days you're there. And the reason why you want 10 days is I think it's because you want to be able to be relaxed. And so if you don't get your kudu today, that's okay. You've got tomorrow and the next right. day and the next day and the next day. And, and there's, that's just make it, makes it such a nice difference. And also don't have your, don't have your, uh, you know, your bar raised too high. Like don't say I have to have a 60 inch kudu. Yeah. You know, just it, tell the pH that I would like a good representative animal of whatever species we're hunting. Yeah. And then relax. You know, because that takes the pressure off of everybody. Uh, you know, when, when Susie and I were in Namibia, she shot a kudu. It was about a 48-inch kudu, which that's like a kind of average size kudu. You know, I was really lucky. I got a 60-inch one when I was in Zimbabwe, but it was just because he was stupid and stood up in front of me. You know, it wasn't because <laughs> okay. I was a great hunter. <laughs> but... Uh, but Susie's has the, he's an old guy and he was a scrapper. So his ears are bitten and he's got scars <laughs> on his neck and the boss on his horns are like as big as a bowling ball, you know? And so everything is, has its merit. And, and I think, you know, having, like I said, don't have your bar up too high, just go there yeah. and enjoy it. You know, non-hunting partners, like in our case, our wives want to go and they don't want to hunt. They just want to go to Africa. So what do they do while you're out uh, playing, you know, Nimrod. <laughs> well, it depends on where you go. Uh, for instance, where we were in Botswana, there there is no touristy things to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, we were 50 minutes from, I think it was a town called Sabong with a T at the front. But it was just a little tiny, tiny, you know, villagey kind of place with yeah. a food store. So there really wasn't any touristy things. But the lodge and the, and, and the camping area was very nice and relaxing. And so... 
I, I actually took a day or two off because I was feeling under the weather. And it was really fun to just relax and read and walk around and explore the area around the lodges and talk to the, you know, the help there and, and, and things like that. I, I puttered around in the shop a little bit with the garage guys. And that was really fun, you know. Yeah. So, uh, so there's that. But if you're a non-hunter usually you just, you accompany the hunter. And so you go oh, okay. right along and you do everything they do. So if you're going to do a stock, then you can go with them or you can stay in the truck or, you know, whatever you want to do. And I really recommend doing that. So wear a broad brim hat. And, and, uh, if you do wear a broad brim hat, like a safari hat, make sure you get something with a, uh, like a way that you can secure it under your chin. Uh -huh. because you're riding on the top of this truck and so you're in the wind all day. So you might find a baseball uh, cap to be a little bit, a little bit more sensible. But uh, the other thing about that stocking thing, I started to, to talk about that earlier is that I also want to recommend that you be open to the idea of shooting from the truck because uh, it's how they do things there. Right. You know, it's, it's not like in America, you know, yes, you can call from vehicles depending on the situation and there's all that kind of special permits and things, but there hunting from the truck often makes the best sense because if you're in an area with really tall grass and you're trying to stock, you may not be able to, yeah. uh, if it's your first time and your heart's beating 90 miles an hour, you can shoot from the truck where you have a secure rest. And so I think, you know, don't try to be, you know, Jeremy of Africa, <laughs> you know, just be Bill from Roanoke, Virginia, yeah. who's, who's trying to have a good time in Africa. And there's no one's going to judge you. As a matter of fact, the pH will encourage you to shoot from the truck because it's reliable. It's safe. It, you know, it's a good rest. Uh, and if something happens, you're right at the truck. So, you know, you can take off after the Afri the animal if you have to, if there's an emergency, your food, you know, whatever. So I like to shoot from the truck. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so I really recommend that. Well, you talked a little bit about uh, uh, clothes and uh, just touched on personal gear, but what are some of the other things? Uh, do I need to take a first aid kit or uh, what kind of boots to wear? Just hunting boots or just kind of touch on some more of that stuff? You know, it's really a good questions because it's funny how once you say, I want to go to Africa, suddenly there's this really long list of questions that pop up. <laughs> you know, exactly. when you start to pack. What I did was the two or three months before the trip, I, I started throwing everything I thought I was going to take in a pile. You know, I got a big duffel bag and just anything. It's like I, I would look at something, I'd say, oh, I could use that in Africa. Throw it in the duffel bag, right? And then later on, you can distill it all out to only the eight or 10 things that you need, actually need. Uh, the clothing, like we talked about, uh, layered really is good there. So depending on the time of the year, remember their year is opposite of ours. So in December, it's hot. Okay, so just remember that it's opposite. But layering there really works. A really lightweight, small day pack is good to carry with you in the truck. And so that's where you have maybe a couple bottles of your own water and a couple energy bars and whatever knick-knacky little things you want to have with you. Your camera when it's not on you, uh, whatever, spare pair of socks. That's where you can stuff your coat you know, once it's nine o'clock and your coat comes off. So uh, I would recommend a very small sort of personal first aid kit, things that band-aids and antiseptic and a bug sting stuff, you know, if there's like a topical ointment. Of course, your personal medication, you should have that with you too. And uh, and then other than that, I, I default to lighter weight hunting shoes. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of times it's hot, of course, but you, low top is okay. And even more of a hiking, you know, like the nylon and leather hiking shoes, like you'd, you'd, you know, hike the Sierras with or something. Yeah. Yeah. That would be, those are really good. Uh, and then long pants, I recommend have a pair of shorts. Uh, since we're Americans and we're sissies because we don't hunt in Africa all the time, you there's, everything has a thorn <laughs> Everything there is going to try to kill you. I yeah. promise you that. And uh, the PHs hunt with shorts on and you'll, they'll come back and their legs will be all bloody. 
but they don't even seem to notice. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I was going to be matcha one day and I started to hunt in a pair of shorts. And that lasted about 50 feet into the first brush that we went into. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. And then I ran screaming like a girl back to the truck and put my long <laughs> pants on. <laughs> so. Okay. Duly noted. Because <laughs> that's, you always see the PHs. Yeah. They've got, uh, you know, boots and, and shorts on and they're never all bloody in the pictures. Yeah, I know. It's, I guess it depends on the angle. Those guys, I swear they're made out of leather though, you know? Uh, now there are ticks and stuff, so you need to sort that out to where, depending on where you're going. And if you're going in a place with ticks, which is virtually everywhere, you do want to have some good deep tick spray to have that along with you. They have something called gaiters, and they're these little top, you know, cuff things that you wear above your boots. Right. Uh, and they kind of help to keep the, you know, the the bad guys out. But I would say that if you're going to go on an American deer hunt, whatever you're going to take on your kind of day hunt in your day pack is kind of what you would take with you there. Uh, they do the heavy lifting, you know, literally and figuratively. They usually have a very well equipped first aid kit. You know, they're going to supply the food. They're going to supply the water, you know, all, the, all that kind of stuff. The, every, any, you don't need to be have a knife that you can clean with, you know, skin and animal. Yeah. If you want to bring one to use to help, that's fine. I'm sure they'll they'll allow you in for a while. You know? I was going to say, they're like, oh, look, the gringo wants to help. <laughs> exactly. How cute is that? You know, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, but uh, yeah, I think if you just remember what your role there is, it's like, I remember one time I had forgotten my day pack. It was back in the truck. And, you know, we were like, I don't know, four or 500 yards away from the truck. And I, I, I touched the pH on the shoulder. And I said, you know, I forgot my pack. I'm going to dash back and get it. And he looked at one of the trackers and said something in Shona or whatever the language was. And the tracker took off at a dead run. And I said, I said, no, oh no, I don't mind. I'll do it. He said, no, you don't understand. That's their job. He said, huh. if, if they didn't do this, then they wouldn't have a job. He said, ah. so, and that really reminded me, you know, that it's like, it's their country. It's their, the way they do business and that you're a guest. And so yeah, be a good guest, you know, yeah. and sort of play by the rules. Now, taxidermy, what are the ins and outs of if you want to bring a couple of heads and have them at home? Excellent question, because that was a big, scary thing to me the first time I went over. I made what I think is a mistake the first time, is that I took the animals and I had them treated. They, they do a dip, uh -huh. uh, you know, on the, the pelts and stuff. And then I had them imported back and you need to have a broker to do this because he's got to negotiate the complicated importation laws and stuff. And I think I paid 300 bucks to an importer to do this for me, which was really handy. I mean, it was turnkey and I recommend you do that. So I got it back here and then I took it to a taxidermist that I had chosen and then he did the work and it all eventually worked out just fine. Huh. I will say this though, <laughs> unless you've got a really big house and a place a 60-inch kudu <laughs> is pretty commanding, you know, and and add in a bless bock and a gems bock and a two impalas and a spring bock and a, well, pretty soon it's like, I don't know that this was a really good idea, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so uh, the second trip I went, which was in uh, Namibia, I had the taxidermy done in Africa. And I have to say, it was two-thirds of the price. Uh, it made importing much easier because you're just importing. It's not animals anymore, right? right. So uh, and it, it was it was just hugely easier. And the other thing we said a minute ago about that's that being their job. Well, this is their lifetime job there, and so these people are really really good at it. Yeah, and I have to say the work that they did on Susie's animal are so, well. You saw them, I think. You were you know. I mean, the zebra just looks like he's like going to wink at you, yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> any second. And uh, so, so I would recommend if you're going to do taxidermy, do it there. Now, if you really must have a shoulder mount of like the world's best kudu or something, fine, do that. But just remember, you're going to pay shipping for this big crate, which ultimately, once it's imported, it actually comes right to your front door. Yeah. Uh, and it doesn't weigh very much, of course, because like any mount, it's just, you know, it's lightweight and the horns come off, then you stick the horns back on. What I really recommend doing is just having European mounts done because it's very affordable and it suddenly turns everything into a much smaller box. Right. And so, yeah. And there's really, other than a zebra, 
I'm I'm not real invested in in tanning any of the skins. I mean, Sukudu is not that interesting. I mean, almost hardly any of them are really that interesting. Yeah. Uh, so that's what I would is is have the head, you know, the European mouse with which is the skull uh, done, on, and and that's pretty cool, you know. And if you do get a zebra, I think you're insane not to have a zebra rug. I was going to say that's that's what I want. Oh yeah, and and also I've seen them on walls, and they actually w- really works that way, you know. They're, yeah. they're, it's actually pretty cool on a wall, and uh, we've got a, a zebra shoulder mount that's kind of turned and looking at you and he's looking at the front door. So when people come in the front door, yeah. they always look up and go, Oh, <laughs> you yeah. know? uh, and then we have a, a, a zebra rug and, uh, and that's cool. I have to admit that's cool. And uh, you know what? Let's address something too. Animals are not going extinct in Africa. Plains game are thick no. as fleas. The only time that's the case, the only place that's happening are in the public parks and that's because they're getting uh, poached. Yeah, yeah. Uh, bush meat is big. That's big business in Africa, especially in the cities. And so, you know, there's not a lot of employment sometimes. And so these people are out basically poaching anything that moves. Uh, but the private ranches usually have their own security. There's usually a, a game fence. And don't let that think that you're not hunting. I mean, in 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 uh, Botswana, we were hunting on 250,000 acres. Wow. That were fenced. <laughs> it, it's, it's a game fence, right? And yeah. so, so they can protect their animals and they're, and they're healthy and they're, and they have water and, you know, and yet right on the other side of the fence, it's game free because everything has just been poached and there's no food and there's no water. And wow. so by hunting like this, you're helping to support that, uh, as the as the as the ranch manager told me when I was last there was he said you have to remember something if if we didn't have hunters here willing to pay for these animals and these animals would have no value mm-hmm. and that's how they would be treated and he yep. said but since they have value then then now they're treated as as any thing that has value and so we take care of them you know we we make sure they they mature well we we take the sick ones we take the the old bulls you know and yeah. stuff like that so and i thought that was such a good observation if you if you because that's actually backfired in botswana when they when they took hunting away right then the game animals suffered because nobody cared so I often read uh, there's other game around there like uh, warthogs and stuff and some warthog ivory seems like it might be intriguing. Is that anything you've ever uh, gone after during one of your hunts? I, I have. As a matter of fact, they're, they're ancillary game in most places. Oh, you, oh, you want to shoot a warthog? That's 50 bucks. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and they're, they're quite funny. If you've never seen them, go to YouTube or someplace and, and look up, get a warthog video. They're these, they're not like our domestic pigs. They, you know, they kind of strut when they walk and, uh, and they, they, they stand up roll like they're at attention kind of, and their little tails stick up in the air. And, and they're another set that are always running. I don't think I ever saw a warthog that wasn't running, you know? <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, we shot them and they're, I mean, it's like, okay, that was fun. You know, yeah. and we did bring back some, you can, those are real popular tourist things. If you buy the tusks, you could buy the tusks. Yeah. I think you just have to be careful, make sure your state doesn't get upset about it or something. Uh. I don't know. But, uh, but yeah, that's fun. Now, some areas there are different kinds of monkeys that that you can take, uh, baboons especially because they're right. basically nuisance. You know, uh, one place that we were at had them, and I mean they were really obnoxious and dangerous. Yeah, they kill people pretty regularly. They do, yeah, and you have to be really careful. So I didn't uh, shoot any of them. But, I, I, you know, I just think this hopefully has gotten people to sort of like, okay, I, now I know a little more about it. I'm going to, you know, do some more uh, research. When we were in Botswana, we went to Kudu Safaris. It's kudu, K-U-D-U dash safaris.com. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and we'll put that in the show notes. Yeah. And, and, and they're, they'll give you an example of what to expect. They show you the lodge and the stuff. They Everyone's different. Some of them are five stars. You go there and you, they rub your feet and everything's taken <laughs> care of. And, you know, I mean, a chef that cooks everything. The bar trek where we were, they're, you know, they're more kind of a working facility. Yeah. And, uh, but they're very comfortable. They're grass huts, but really they're very nice. You know, uh, my wife, Susie, who's, you know, 
a picky. You know, she was she was perfectly happy. Hot showers, solar you meant, power. You meant discerning because she may listen to this. She is yeah. discerning. Discerning is a good word for it. But we were always very comfortable there and very safe. We felt very safe. Everybody was very nice. So you just look at your budget and stuff. And speaking of budget, if you can right now, because I looked right now, you can fly round trip to Africa for as cheap as a thousand to twelve hundred dollars. Wow! So I don't recommend doing a nonstop flight just because that's eighteen hours in the air, and you might as well just kill yourself. You know, <laughs> I've done that, and uh, so you can do two. You can bounce to some place like uh, Frankfurt or Zurich, and then you fly south from there. So basically, you get sort of two nine or 10 hour flights, but it's nice because if you do a layover, you can rent a hotel room, kind of have a nap, take a shower, relax. And that's another reason not to take guns with you because it's just like, you don't have all that. Yeah. And you literally, really, I've seen people do this all the time. They go with just their carry on. I mean, as long as you don't take a knife with you, which technically you don't really need a knife while you're there, yeah. but uh, you can technically do with just carry on. So that's how you get there. And then a ride along person is usually like about 150 bucks a day. Usually it depends on, on the, on the pH. So if your wife or non hunters and that's a room and board. So, uh, alcohol you usually have to pay for over and above. And then, uh, game itself is really dependent on the location and how touristy it is. It tends to be more expensive in South Africa. And I would be aware of packaged hunts, you know, we get, well, you know, you can have two Impala and a Kudu and a Warthog for $5,000 or something like that is don't compromise. And so I would shop around a little bit and don't book with the first guy you look at, you know, because the more you shop, the more you learn, uh, spend some money, call them up, Skype with them, you know, ask to see pictures if they're, if you don't see pictures of their facility. Uh, I've talked to people who've been very, very surprised and not always in a good way. You know, so uh, generally you should be friends with them before you go there. And uh, they pick you up at the airport and then they drive out to wherever you're going. And now that is one advantage of South Africa is you fly into Johannesburg, for instance, and you, your drive might only be two hours and you're out where you'll be hunting. Yeah. Of course, that's almost all heavy fence, game ranch, thousand to three thousand acre places. Yeah. So where we went, it's you fly in uh, and then you overnight and then oh, they picked you up and then you drive to the camp the next day. But it was really fun because you, we drove through the Kalahari Desert for crying out loud. Yeah. You know, and it was like, holy gee, look at this. You know, this is, <laughs> oh, my God. This, look at that. Look at that. You yeah. know, and so it was all part of the adventure. So um, I guess that's kind of a real quick overview. Maybe we should do this again someday and talk about more things. Probably we ought to do part two and I'll have some real specific questions we can get down to because I've been sitting here taking notes furiously and uh, thinking about the different things. But part of my procedure has been, I'm sure you did the same thing. We're blessed to know a lot of guys that have been over there, uh, some guys multiple times. So I'm not, I'm trying not to reinvent the wheel. <laughs> so, you know, talk to your friends and coworkers and people, you know, that uh, have done some of this stuff so that uh, I realize I will be a rank amateur when I get over there, but at least hopefully I won't be a complete babe in the woods. So, uh, well, you know, if the, the big thing to remember when you're there is don't be what you, we used to call ugly American. Right? Oh yeah. Just whatever comes up, you smile and say yes. Or whatever comes up, you smile and say thank you. Or you smile and say that's okay. Right? Because then these PHs will bend over backwards, man, and they'll take good care of you. They'll make sure you have a good time. And maybe they'll say things like, this happened to me one time. He says, hey, you know, we're, we're going to call some a spring bar for the chicken or for the kitchen. You want to come? Well, yeah. Wow. I, yeah. You know, I got to shoot eight spring bar. Wow. You know? Which is, I mean, that's like a safari, you yeah. Know, you know, and you wouldn't have got that opportunity if you had been that guy. If you were that guy, yeah. And and I got to come back and I helped them unload in the kitchen, and they were all smiling because that was part of what their staff is. They get one spring buck a month as ah. as you know food allowance <laughs> rations, huh? 
yeah, rations, and but that's part of the salary, kind of. And so, yeah. Uh, so, and we, are, you are right, though. We have an advantage. Is Mark Hampton, who writes a handgun hunting column for Handgunner Rights for Guns, of course, regularly. He's been to Africa, I think, now thirty times. Oh my goodness! So there's really nothing you can't that he doesn't know. And yeah. so, of course, I've picked his brain through the years, and so it's like I, I've been there three times, but really, I've kind of been there more than that because I, you know like you said we know all these people and so what i've finally done was i've kind of distilled it down to what are the what are the common denominators all yeah. the time and uh and basically it's pack light have a positive attitude get in shape before you go you know i mean you don't have to be iron man but get out of your chair and go walk it and you know yeah. get some air and uh I, I wouldn't take a gun your first trip and uh and don't have high hopes. Just go there and enjoy it. Whatever comes along your way, you smile and, and say thank you and take the game and enjoy the dinners and come back and regale your friends with all your stories of your African <laughs> safari. <laughs> well, great advice. And, and I have to say that the thing that convinced me is every time I talk to somebody that's been to Africa, I swear to you every time about two or three sentences in, they get that look. They just start looking off into the distance <laughs> and that thousand yard stare. And you can just tell it's a, uh, a life altering experience and probably one of the most uh, intense, but uh, memorable and enjoyable things that a hunter can do. So I'm looking forward to it. And Roy, I appreciate all the uh, advice and you know I'm going to be picking your brain a lot more but thanks for talking to us on this episode of the podcast and we'll look forward to doing uh, episode number two the advanced class I, I think it'd be a lot of fun I'll tell you how hard it hits you when we were in uh, Botswana we seriously negotiated about becoming part owners of one of the ranches <laughs> yeah that's pretty serious <laughs> but that's another story It was great talking to Roy, and I made lots of notes for my own safari. And with that, we hope you're enjoying the Guns Magazine podcast. If you do enjoy what we're doing, you'll also love our new Guns, American Handgunner, and AmericanCop.com t-shirts. You can visit Guns Magazine or AmericanHandgunner.com forward slash apparel to see the shirts, or if you want our groundbreaking Defund the Media shirt, visit AmericanCop.com. We've extended the deadline due to popular demand, but you need to get yours today because they're going to be gone soon. If you have questions or comments you'd like to share, please email me. That's editor at gunsmagazine.com. Make sure you don't miss out on anything by subscribing to us on your favorite podcast directory or check it out at gunsmagazine.com on the podcast tab. And finally, before we go, I'd like to remind you to check out our sponsor, Kimber Firearms at KimberAmerica.com. That's it for this episode of the Guns Magazine podcast. For the entire staff here at FMG Publications, I'm Guns Magazine editor Brent Wheat. Now get out there and get shooting. <laughs> <laughs>